Merci Jean-François pour l'invitation. Euh, je dois avouer que les, les physiciens sont aussi très patients avec moi, donc euh, je ne vous montrerai pas beaucoup d'équations. Je, j'essaierai surtout d'insister sur les allers-retours qu'il peut y avoir entre expérience et modélisation. Uh, I do it in English, huh? Jean-François. Uh, okay. okay. So today, what I would like to discuss is some of our recent work on uh, proliferation, so cell division, uh, during uh, tissue morphogenesis. Okay. And, and you will see that. Uh, so this was our basic question, and, and overall we end up working on, on something which is quite different, which is how a cell can sense its, sh its, sa its sh shape and size during morphogenesis. So uh, shape is uh, uh, an obvious uh, properties of any living uh, matter, and it underlies basic functions such as locomotion, reproduction, and predation. And uh, the process of morphogenesis, I think, which uh, uh, Jean-François has been discussing during his lecture, is, I think, beautifully illustrated by, by this movie of, sorry, there is a problem, of our own development, where you are going to see that the shaping of our face is, in fact, a quite complex process, and at the same time, quite interesting because we should not stop at the middle of it. I think it's very important that we end, end it, okay? And so, of course, uh, this process is regulated both by genetics and mechanical forces. And while shape is extremely diverse, there is a basic framework to understand the process of tissue morphogenesis. And as uh, uh, Jean-François mentioned, uh, Drosophil has been having a key role in this, uh, in, in the dis deciphering this process. And, So far, I would like to use a simple uh, morphogenetic process, which is called gastrulation, which is when you form your mesoderm in drosophila to illustrate what are the key steps and which underlie basically the interconnection between biology and physics. So the basic idea behind uh, tissue morphogenesis is that you first define a group of cells here represented by this blue region where you are going to express key regulatory genes that are going to specify this region of the tissues. And these regulatory genes are going to change the distribution of a component of the cytoskeleton, myosin, which is going to regulate cortical tension, and also e which is important for cell-cell adhesion. And uh, what is quite well known now is that, and, and you can see here this redistribution. So here you have calorine in red, which labels the cell interfaces, okay, which allows the cell to adhere to each other. And here in this region where the gene was uh, actually expressed, what you can see is that myosin become apically localized. And this apical localization will actually change the shape of the cell. Of course, in a tissue, since cells are interconnected, those forces are going to be transmitted between cells. And therefore, what you are going to have is not only one cell that is going to change its shape, but a collective dynamic of all the cells, which will lead to a large-scale deformation. And this is what illustrated in this movie, where you can see that all the cells are going to flow towards the center of the embryo and invaginate. And obviously, this movement depends on the stress within the tissues, the mechanical properties of the tissues, and also the geometry. So this gives you a general outline on how, basically, you can connect gene expression, so therefore biology, and a change in tissue shape. But if you look at this, uh, so this framework is extremely important to understand tissue morphogenesis and how you can generate shape during uh, development. But obviously there is one thing which is missing in this uh, process, which is proliferation. And here I'm showing you another movie of a zebrafish embryo where both DNA and membrane has been labeled. And what you can see is that during development, The cell, the tissue is actually adopting a given shape, but at the same time, the number of cells is also increasing. So that at the end of the day, the embryo does not only have the correct shape, but also the correct size and the correct number of cells. And so there is, during development, an apparent coordination between the process of proliferation, which is increasing the cell number, and the process of morphogenesis. And this is uh, what uh, drives our interest. And basically, this movie uh, allows to asked two very uh, fundamental questions in biology. How is cell division regulated during the morphogenesis of the tissues? And how do cell division contribute to the overall shaping of an animal? And if you think about those two questions, you need to address them at two very different scales. First, you need to understand the process of cell division itself at the cellular level. 
And of course, cell division has been extensively studied in, in, in the term of the temporal regulation. When do cells divide? Okay, because I, I guess, and how often the cell divide? What is the rate of proliferation? In the context of morphogenesis, another aspect which is going to be important is what we call the regulation in space. For example, here you have a structure which is in green, which is a mitotic spindle, which is going to be quite important in this talk. And you see that the orientation of this mitotic spindle is going to position the two daughter cells within the tissues. And it's quite intuitive to think that the orientation of this mitotic spindle is going to define the relative arrangement of cells within the tissues. Okay, I say intuitive because, in fact, the cell division is extremely tiny relative to the overall scale of an animal. So not only do we need to understand the process of cell division at the cellular level, but we need to understand how collectively cell division can generate just large-scale changes at the scale of an animal. And last but not least, and I, I think it's not this audience that I should uh, convince, is that, of course, if uh, cells are moving within these tissues, that there is mechanical forces that are exerted by the cell and that are uh, to which the cells are responding. And there is something which is very important, is to understand the interplay between cell division and mechanical forces. So in the lab, we use a drosophila as a model system, okay? And we are going to work at a, a specific stage where there is a very large amount of morphogenesis. So a fly lay an egg, which become a larvae, and then it become a pupa, so it's like the cocoon of the butterfly. And within this cocoon, it's going to undergo, actually, a metamorphosis. And just to illustrate the amount of morphogenesis that you get at this stage, I will do an experiment that I can still do, which is to take uh, the uh, cocoon, so the pupae. I'm going to remove, actually, the pupal case. Okay? And you see that at this stage, the animal is, looks like more like a tube, actually. And you can see the wings here, for example, but most of it is like a tube. And within four days, it's actually going to become a fly. Okay? So this shows you the extent of or the amount of morphogenesis that you have at this stage. And what is important is that most of this morphogenesis takes place, in fact, within 24 hours. After, during three days, it's just actually uh, change color and, and harden tissues. So since we could actually, uh, um, this, the animal at this stage is actually completely static, and we can actually just access the tissue by removing this pupal case, which is a dead material. So I should say that after the movie that I'm going to show you, a perfect fly will hatch and will fly away, actually. Okay. So what we did was to focus on one region of the tissue, which is the back of the fly for historical reason. And what we did actually was to label each individual cell by a membrane marker, which is E. calorie. Okay. And uh, on this movie, what you can do is actually to follow the full dynamic of the tissues. Okay. And uh, what you can see at this level of resolution is the overall flows of cells within the tissues. Okay. So, of course, the morphogenesis that you see here is not as drastic as the one I show you during human development or during zebrafish development. What is quite important to understand is that these tissues is, in fact, a monolayered and cuboidal epithelial layer of cells. So there is only one layer of cell in these tissues, which actually simplifies quite extensively its analysis. More importantly, the method that we are using is so-called multiscale, because at the same time, in the same movie, we can follow both the cell dynamics to loop, and the tissue scale dynamics. So we can relate what happened at cell level and what happened at tissue scale level. And as the movie will loop, you can see that each time you have a division, the cell round up. So here, all those black dots, actually, are cell division. And if you would count the number of cell division, you will end up with a number close to 25,000. So each time you see this movie, you see 25,000 cell division. So it's a good model to study the interplay between morphogenesis and, actually, uh, cell proliferation. One aspect which is key is that also the tissue is heterogeneous, and you will see that this will become quite important. So, for example, if I take, of course, so why I say it's important? Because I'm trying to somehow uh, show you that it's, it's good because we can follow 25,000 cell division, but if all the cell division looks the same, all the parameters are, are the same, there is not really any point of following 25,000 cell division, we can follow one. What is important is that as it is a biological tissue, in fact, uh, if I take one image and I just segment it, okay, I'm just put it in the computer, do the cell outline, what you can see is that if you look at cell size, for example, it's quite diverse within the tissue. So here, in red, this is a big cell, and in blue, this is a small cell. Okay? So here, this is a midline, actually, and you can, I think, appreciate that there is a symmetry between the two sides at a certain length scale. So this is cell size which is quite diverse within the tissues. And also, for example, if you look at cell shape, one parameter of cell shape, which is its anisotropy. So uh, green cells are the ones which are quite round, actually, and 
orange is a cell which are quite elongated. And again, you see that there is an heterogeneity in shape within the tissues. So of course, there is two questions which are important to address. How is this heterogeneity in size and how is this heterogeneity in shape are regulated? But what I would like to show you in my talk is that, in fact, the cell is able to sense this two heterogeneity and to change its dynamic. In fact, the tissue is also heterogeneous at, uh, so and this is the rate of proliferation, which is also heterogeneous throughout the tissues. Last but not least, uh, as I mentioned, we would like to study proliferation. And if I zoom up in some region of the tissue, okay, and I play those movie, what you can see is that all the regions are proliferated, but the dynamic of each of those regions is very different. And therefore, it is quite interesting at the tissue scale level because we can study how cell division interplay with many different morphogenetic processes, such as cell rearrangement, cell deaths, or cell shape changes. Okay? So using this system, today I would like to tell you a little bit of our work. And first, feel free to interrupt me at any time. The three parts are very independent, so I can stop any time if you have any question. Uh, so I will try to show you uh, things that we do at the cell level, in particular how you define the position of the two daughter cell within the tissues, and how a cell can sense its shape. And then I will uh, show you how basically we can go from the cell level to the tissue scale level in terms of quantification. And once we are at the tissue scale level, I will show you how we can go back to the cell level due to actually global tissue scale morphogenetic stress. And I will show you how basically a cell can sense its size, and therefore adapt its dynamic. So therefore, there will be three parts. Sensing of cell shape, regulation of mitotic spin orientation, which is cell division orientation. Tissue level, so I will introduce general tool to connect cell and tissue scale dynamics. And then I will go back to the cell level from the measurement of tissue scale morphogenetics uh, tissues, and I will show you how a cell, in fact, uh, measure its size. So first, before I, uh, I, I go into the work, and because I might not have time, I would like to really thank my team for, for the work I'm going to present. I'm very lucky. I have an amazing team uh, composed of both biologists and physicists. And so this big movie that I show you were actually made by Floris Boswald, who just decided to make them. And it was uh, really the opening of a large number of projects. It also has been a long-standing collaboration with uh, one physicist, Francois Graner. And uh, so the work on cell division is a collaboration between Floris Boswell, who is a biologist, and Olga Markova, who is here, who is a physicist. The tool that I will show you to connect cell and tissue scale has been developed by uh, Boris Girao and uh, Francois Graner. And uh, last but not least, uh, coming back to the cell level, I will show you this sensing of cell size, which is actually done by uh, Rezus G. Lopez in the lab, who is a postdoc. And this is done in collaboration with David Lubinsky, which is at, who is at Michigan University. So let's start with uh, spindle orientation so, and positioning of cell upon cell division. So uh, I think uh, Jean-Francois presented this. So when, when a cell is about to divide, it has a certain side. It's what we call interface, usually. During division, the cell will round up. Okay? And I will, show, I, will, I will mention why rounding up is important. And the cell will then divide. So this has been extensively studied individual cell. Okay, this is a process which is extremely important if you want to increase your cell numbers. Now, if you look at a cell division within a tissue, and it's exactly the same, it looks exactly like what you expect. So basically here, what happens is that you form this mitotic spindle, and the orientation of the mitotic spindle is going to define the position of the two daughter cell. So if we want to understand how the cell are arranged within a tissue, we need to understand how the mitotic spindle is oriented within the tissues. And for example, you can very easily imagine that if all the mitotic spindles are oriented in one direction, basically you will tend to elongate your tissue in one direction, explaining why it is so important to understand how you can orient your spindle within the tissues. So how you orient the spindle is, is a very old question, which has been extensively studied, in particular in the context of stem cell, where you have a lineage. So there is one cell, a small number of cells that divide. And the basic idea is that, of course, what you will do to orient your spindle, you will tell your cell, basically, that he has one pole. For example, here I'm showing here where you are going to localize an information at one pole of the cell. And this, will, is, going to, so, and this is going to tell the cell, OK, let's divide along this direction. OK? And the basic idea behind it is that on the mitotic spindle, there is microtubules that are going to connect 
to the cortex where this molecule is going to actually uh, be localized. And this is going to regulate forces that are going to, to orient the spindle in one direction. Okay? So this is, a, this is something that has been extensively studied in asymmetric cell division or stem cell division. But you see that the key point here is that you need to polarize your cell. So you need in each cell to tell the cell uh, this is the front and this is the back and to decide both on an orientation and a direction. And in fact, it's quite uh, striking to, and it's quite difficult to imagine that this will be the process that, apply, that happen at tissue scan. So you mean that for each individual cell, you will define a polarity. Okay? So this is possible. But in fact, there is a rule which is even more ancient, and this is a so-called universal rule of cell division that was proposed by uh, Oscar Hertwig in 1884. So it's a rule that has more than 130 years. So in what uh, Oscar Hertwig was doing in 1884, he was doing some of the first uh, mechanical biology experiments. He was taking uh, amphibian embryos and he was pressing those amphibian embryos. They are round, okay, and he was pressing them. And what he noticed is that when you look at the plane of cleavage, the plane of cleavage is always orthogonal to the direction of cell elongation. Okay, so if I frame this in our 21th century wording, it means that the spindle, the so mild spindle, is always oriented along the long cell cell axis. Okay? And this has become actually uh, became almost an universal rule of cell division within tissues. The so mechanism by and so you see that what is important is that the cell is able to sense the cell long axis or actually the mechanical deformation. Okay? And there is beautiful work that has been done by Manuel Terry in Michel Bornin's lab or by Nicolas Mank, with whom we have been collaborating on this project, on how to explain in a single cell how a cell can sense its shape. Actually. In multicellular context, this was completely unknown at the time. What we knew is that the Hertwig rule, which for which I mentioned that it's almost universal, has been key in the regulation of tissue organization and morphogenesis. It has been uh, key, for example, in the response of tissue to stress, and it's also important for tissue layering. So basically, what a, there is many functions for this rule which has been proposed, and this rule has been verified in numerous tissues. So if you look at any tissue, the cells tend to divide according to their long axis. And actually, I'm going to show you one example. So this is a cell which is about to divide. This is from a paper from uh, Matt Gibson. And you see that this cell is slightly elongated, okay? And you can uh, very easily do, by a ma simple mathematical operation, fit an ellipse, determine the long cell axis, which I show you here in blue. And if you look at the end of the movie, basically what you can see is that the cell has, in fact, roughly divided according to the long axis that is defined in interface, okay? So this is uh, what is called the Hertwig rule. Of course, it's a statistical rule. It's not perfect, but on average, it tends to divide according to the shape in interface. The issue is, a, is the following, is that when a cell divides, the cell rounds up. Okay? And uh, as you can see, as it rounds up, it loses its interphasic shape. Okay? So you have an information in interface, but you lose this information during cell division. And the rounding of a cell during mitosis as shown by the work of Busbaum and Mathieu Piel, for example, is extremely important for efficient segregation of chromosomes, so for the integrity of your, genome, of your genome when you divide. In fact, it seems that, so it means that at mitosis, when you are orienting your spindle, you have the information of shape, which was defined in interface, is actually lost. So it seems that you have two very antagonistic rules. You need to divide according to your interphasic cell shape, but at the same time, you need to, to actually round up at mitosis. So you lose this information. So the problem that we had to understand was twofold. We had to understand how a cell can sense this shape, but between quotes, because I'm, uh, it's recorded, basically, how basically the cell can remember, knowing that the cell do not remember anything, basically. There must be a mark or a cue that, is, that, is, that remains within the cell while the cell rounds up. Okay, and, and so uh, we started to tackle this problem by a very uh, classical approach in biology, which was to look at the localization of diverse molecules, which are localized, how those molecules are localized during cell division. And um, we stumbled off one molecule that, that, that attracted our attention, which is called MUD. So what, what the molecule is doing and its name, it's not very important, but what you can see is that this molecule, which is shown in the localization shown in white, is that this molecule has very peculiar localization. So here you have a cell, and you can see that this molecule is enriched 
at corner of the cell. And those corners are actually vertex, or what we call in biology tricellular junction. So you see that this molecule is actually enriched exactly where three epithelial cells meet. And I think there is a lot of question of how a molecule can localize there, how a molecule can recognize the contact of three cells. Okay? But what was very uh, striking for us is that if we look at the dynamic of this molecule, while the cell round up, what you can see is that the molecule remains at those tricellular junction. It also becomes localized at the centrosome, which is quite handy because we will be able to determine the orientation of the spindle. And the, I have a here. Yeah, yeah. So when you show us this, how should we see the third dimension? Is that an average or the third dimension? You should not think about it. No. Uh, so basically, it's, uh, it's one plane. The molecule is localized at the level of so called septic junction, which is uh, something which is half a micron. And the spindle becomes localized. So, the, so, of course, orientation of the spindle is a, tree, is a question in 3D. So you have to put it in the plane of the tissues, in the tissues. And once it's in the plane, you have to find the orientation. And I'm only going to discuss this orientation, assuming that the tissue is already within the plane. The rounding up, for instance, is this something ah. about 3D? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, I indeed, the rounding up is really... So, uh, so we do have a cuticle on this tissue. So the top of the cell remains flat or relatively flat, because if you want to maintain the tension, actually, if you have force, having force balance, you should have actually a small bombing like this, but it's quite flat. And then, uh, so the cell will be, uh, so if I cut it from the side, the cell will be roughly like this, with a spindle that will form here. Okay? Okay, and the molecule mud will be localized here. Okay, so that's why I'm doing everything view from the top. Okay, this is a view from the top assuming that everything is taking place in one plane. Okay. Okay, so feel free to interrupt me if you have a question. So first, we need to verify that this molecule is indeed localized at tricellular junction. And you can see that for this, we use molecules which are known to be localized at tricellular junction. For example, I, I, this molecule, which is called gliotactin. Again, the name is not, it's not very important. You can see that it co-localized perfectly with mud at tricellular junction. So then uh, we can also uh, do something which is classic classical in biology. We can remove gene and see whether the molecule will be still localized at tricellular junction. So for example, if I remove glee, I see that the localization at tricellular junction of this molecule mud is decreased. And if I remove another molecule, which is called discharge, which remove all known molecules at tricellular junction, you can see that the molecule mud is completely gone. Okay? So, so far, I have said really not something which is uh, quite uh, drastic, which is I just said that there is a molecule which is localized at tricellular junction that remains at tricellular junction while the cell round up. Okay? And of course, we knew that this molecule in other systems has a role in spindle orientation. Okay? So the first thing that, that, that we decided to do was to try to see if when the cell is round, is the localization of mud at tricellular junction sufficient to predict spindle orientation? Okay? Because uh, the, the basic idea behind this is that the, the cell is round, mud is at tricellular junction. If mud is sufficient to predict spindle orientation, it's probably that it has a role in spindle orientation, and therefore maybe it could, add, it could act as a memory of what happened in interface. But here we are going to concentrate only at the time at which the cell is round. And so in order to predict spindle orientation, the first thing that we had to do was to try to first evaluate the nature of the force which are exerted on the spindle. And if you think about the spindle and its interaction with the cell cortex, you can have two types of force. First, you can have pulling forces that are going to pull on the cortex, or you can have pushing forces okay, that are going to push on the microtubule, and both will generate a torque which is sufficient to orient the spindle. And it's quite easy, actually, to distinguish between those two, those two um, um, types of forces. You can just do a, an ablation. I think Jean-François showed you some ablation, but here we are not going to ablate the membrane. We are going to ablate the astral microtubule. And so if we ablate in this case, what you can see is that if you ablate here, so you remove those pulling forces, the spindle should recoil away from the site of ablation, while if you have pushing forces, the spindle should recoil toward the site of ablation. Okay? So this will give us the, nat the nature of the force and should allow also up to a prefactor to calculate the magnitude of those forces. And this is this experiment. So I remind you that this is a quite tricky experiment because this is done in a tissues. We don't dissect. We really do the experiments on the tissues. And so what Floris did uh, is going to actually ablate the astral microtubule here, 
and we can see that you see three coils away. So this is this line where basically you see in the wall type, basically, the uh, micro spindle tend to recoil away from the site of ablation. Now we can do these experiments in different mutants, where we can do it in a main mutant, in a discharge mutant and a gliotactin mutant. All those mutants tend to remove the activity at tricellular junction. Because either we remove mud, either we remove the localization of mud at tricellular junction. And what you can see is that in this case, in all those cases, we actually lose the pulling forces. So the conclusion of this was that basically a mud at tricellular junction is very likely to exert pulling forces on the astral microtubule. Okay? So we have the measurement in wild type. We know that we have pulling forces. Then we take a mutant that removes the molecule and we see that we lose those pulling forces. So therefore, we conclude that mud is important to generate those forces. And it is important to generate those forces at tricellular junction because if we specifically remove mud localization at tricellular junction, we don't have those forces. Okay? So knowing this, we are going to try to predict now mitic spindle orientation. And so what we are going to do is to take a cell which is already wrong, and this is a time-lapse movie. The cell is here. It's just about to divide. Okay, so this is the orientation of the mitic spindle. And we are going to... So this is where we team up with Nicolas Mank, that where we are going to reuse a model that was actually uh, initially developed by uh, Frank Julischer and... Uh, Manuel Terry in single cell. And the idea is that we are going to, so we are going to modify this, 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 this model, but what we are going to do is that we are going to take the shape of the cell, okay, and we are going to assume that the force on astral microtubule directly scale with the intensity of mud. Okay? And what we are going to ask is what is the position, the, the equilibrium position, and we are going to compare the prediction of the model with the one that we can have in the experiments. Okay? And the way we plot this is just that we do the difference between the prediction of the model minus the actual experimental division. So if the prediction is very bad, we should get half, I mean, basically a random distribution. While if the prediction is good, we should get a bar center around zero. Okay? And of course, we are going to do this with MUD as a predictor of cell division orientation and with a classical Hertwig rule. Okay? And what we are very happy to, to find is that if you look you do the model with uh, mud as a predictor, you get a better prediction than the one that you will get with shape. So telling you that when the cell is round, actually, what drives spindle orientation is like not actually the shape of the cell, but it's a distribution of mud at tricellular junction. Okay? So this tells you that when the cell is round, basically, what orients the spindle is the localization of mud at tricellular junction. Okay? Now, the key question becomes how does this account for the sensing of the shape and for the memory of the shape while the cell round up? Okay. So, of course, uh, to, do, to address those two questions, what we wanted to do was to be able to record MUD from interface throughout division. But this was not possible just because the signal of MUD was too dim. So what we are going to do is to rely on a proxy, which is the actual position of the vertex or the tricellular junction. Okay. So here we have a cell. And we can, just by labeling its membrane, know the position of its vertex and know also its, its shape. So what we can measure for this cell is its shape. We can fit an ellipse and measure its long axis. Okay? So we have a blue bar which will define the long axis according to which uh, it should divide according to the earth we group. But as we... Sorry. As we have uh, discovered that mud, mud was localized on tricellular junction, we decided to invent this new uh, measurement, which we call tricellular junction bipolarity, which only takes into account the position of the tricellular junction. And mathematically, you can also define a long axis which will give you the relative position of those tricellular junction or vertex. Okay? So you have two measurements, the cell shape long axis and the, the main orientation of the tricellular junction position of a cell. So what is important to realize is that those two measurements are very different, are not, are not measuring the same thing. So if I look at this cell, for example, which is quite elongated, what you can see is that this is the orientation of cell shape, and this is the uh, overall distribution of the tricellular junction, and they are quite aligned. Okay? However, if I take this cell which is rounder, you can see that the shape is along this direction, but the, posi the relative position of tricellular junction is along this direction. So you have cells where those two measurements are perfectly aligned, and 
measurement where they are actually not aligned. So what we decided to do was to look at those cells, actually. Because if you look at those cells, you can determine whether the cell is actually sensing its shape or it's sensing the position of the tricellular junction. Okay? So if I take this group of cells, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to try to predict cell division based either on cell shape or the position of tricellular junction. And you can see that the position of tricellular junction is doing a good job, where in fact cell shape is almost anti-correlated. Of course, if you take cells where the two axes are aligned, you get the same type of prediction. So this simple observation tells you that, in fact, the cell is actually not reading its shape. It's actually reading the position of the tricellular junction where mud will be localized, actually. So, but this raises a problem because, as I told you, uh, the Hartwig rule is also almost an universal rule, and everybody has, thought, has measured that the cell is actually dividing according to its cell shape and not to the position of the tricellular junction. Okay? In fact, this... this, uh, this um, This paradox is very simple to resolve. Just we can look at the relative proportion of those two cell types. So the majority of cells have actually those two axes aligned, actually. And a very small proportion has those two axes misaligned. So if you are measuring cell shape, basically, and you try to predict according to cell shape, you are going to find that the cell divide according to its cell shape. Okay? So the last uh, thing that, that... So this tells you that, in fact, the cell is actually... Uh, dividing according to the relative position of the tricellular yeah. junction. But in most of the cases, the axis of the defined by the tricellular junction and the cell shape is the same. Okay? So the last question that remains to be addressed is why basically the relative position of the tricellular junction and cell shape are usually aligned. Okay? And so to, to address this, to address, to answer this, I'm going to do a, so what I call a PowerPoint simulation. So this is a biology a simulation, what we can do actually. I think it's, uh, so I'm going to take a group of hexagonal cells, okay? And I'm going just to pull on it with Photoshop, okay? And you see that when you do so, basically, you, you just define a long axis, okay? Before there was no long axis, but when you do so, you reposition your tricellular junction. And if you think at the main direction of the tricellular junction, they are indeed aligned with cell shape. Okay, so it seems that it's purely a geometric roll rule, actually. When you elongate your cell, you reposition your vertex, and therefore, those vertex will become aligned with you. Okay? So this is a very uh, simple and, uh, uh, I mean, as I say, a PowerPoint simulation. So we are going to use the POTS model that was actually developed by François Graner, with whom we are collaborating, where we, as, as, as Jean-François tell you, it's, it's, it's a good model to actually simulate cell shape um, in epithelial tissues. And uh, the blue bar represents the cell shape, and the red bar represents basically the position of the tricellular junction. And you can see that in many cells, this is aligned, actually, but there is some cell where it's misaligned. And what we are going to do is we are going to elongate the tissue, and therefore we are going to elongate the cell shape in one direction. And when we do this in this simulation, you can see that now, indeed, basically, all these axes become really well aligned. Okay? So this shows you that, in fact, and, and this can be quantified here, so here you have a round cell, Okay, I mentioned. So where basically when the cell tend to be round, so therefore when there is no cell shape long axis to be measured, you can see that those two axes tend, tend to be not really well aligned. So this is the difference between the orientation of cell shape and the orientation of tricellular junction. So you see you have high standard deviation. This is for round cell. But as the cell become more and more elongated, basically this, uh, this difference between the long axis defined by tricellular junction and cell shape, decrease. Okay? This is the experimental measurement, and this is what comes out of the simulation. Okay? Yeah? So talking about cell shape and tricellular junctions, aren't the tricellular junction associated with forces from the other cells in the living cell? And is it the, isn't it the forces of the cell that decide how the living mitotic is reoriented? So... Um, I, um, so we need the geometrical power yeah. Yes, so, so the, the only, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm using the position of tricellular junction as a, as a predictor. And of course, you can say I'm just looking at the correlation. And there is something else which is actually relevant to it. The, the reason why I, I, I don't, um, I think we, we go a little bit further, it's not the, it's not the, the forces which are important, is, is twofold. First, uh, because mud, which is, is important to orient the spindle, is localizer. 
And if you remove mud, you lose the orientation relative to cell shape. So you could argue, in fact, that mud is important to sense the shape, the, the force exerted by the surrounding cell. So this I cannot exclude. What, I, what we have done, actually, is, is, is another experiment. We have looked at a tissue where, basically, the tissue is going to increase the stress that is applied on this tissue, and therefore the cells are going to become more and more elongated. I will show you this in the, in the other part. And what you can find in this case is that, the, indeed, the position of the tricellular junction becomes aligned with the main direction of stress. So I think what is important to... to and it's true that in the field there is always this debate whether it is a cell shape which is sense or is it the actual uh, stress which is, which is sense. And I think this resolves actually this, uh, this, this two aspects because once the cell is under stress, it's going to be, become elongated. You are going to reposition your tricellular junction and therefore you are going to orient according to cell shape or stress. The key thing that, that we haven't resolved is whether mud by itself will be a mechanosensitive molecule and will be more localized, for example, at uh, tricellular junction which are under more stress. This we haven't checked, actually. And this is indeed possible that, that this is happening. But I, I think that the fact that, that mud is important and that uh, mud is localizer argue for the, for the fact that this is not the force which is sent, but really the position. What? And pulling on the... So... Uh, to, to try to, reor to reorient the spindle. Um, no, we, we, we cannot do this. What we can do, which we haven't done, will be, for example, to cut a junction. So if you would, and, and therefore you will release the tension, and you should reorient on a short time scale, because basically uh, you would assume that in this case, the, the cell being round, you cut, and maybe this will, will address your question, basically. Or the other option that will be more to test our model will be to actually remove mud only on one vertex. Because, and we can measure the tension on this vertex and show that it hasn't changed. So these experiments we have done, in this case, you tend to reorient the spindle. Okay. We, are, we have done partially, I should say. So, and uh, what is quite nice is that the position of mud at tricellular junction also explains the memory effect. Because, so when you have a cell which is actually uh, elongated and rounded up, what happens is that the relative position of the vertex does not change, actually. The cell rounded up, so the cell loses its anisotropy and therefore the information of shape, but it does not lose information of anisotropy encoded within the position of the vertex, because just the cell actually inflates. So basically what I have to tell you is that uh, we have actually um, uncovered a basic mechanism by which cell will actually orient their division according to their shape. Okay? So when a cell is in interface, by localizing a molecule at tricellular junction, this molecule staying at tricellular junction will allow to orient the division within the tissues along the long cell axis. And you can see that this is quite important because this cell is quite elongated and by orienting your division relative to your long cell axis, actually, you actually end up with two cells which are much more round. Okay. So what is important also from, from a general perspective is that by localizing a molecule at tricellular junction, basically the cell, each cell within the tissues has a built-in built uh, polarity cues. The cell knows what is its elongation. And there is more and more molecules which are localized at tricellular junction, including regulator of proliferation or also regulator of the cytoskeleton. So you can envision that by localizing molecules at tricellular junction, can actually inform the cell on its shape. Okay? Of course, this raises a basic question, is that when the cell will divide, it will reform new tricellular junction, okay? and so you will rebuild, and so we have actually studied how you rebuild those new tricellular junction at the next division. Okay, how much time? Yeah. Okay, so, Sorry. yes? So uh, we know from a biological point of view, so which we know the, 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 the so what we did was to screen for molecules that will be important to localize this molecule at uh, tricellular junction, and what we found was another molecule which is localized at tricellular junction. So of course it's uh, it's one step, but it does not answer the key question of how a molecule can recognize a vertex. Actually. 
Yeah. So uh, for MUD, it's a, it's a cortical protein, but the molecule which is important to localize MUD at tricellular junction is a transmembrane molecule. And what is important, is what, what has been proposed through uh, uh, simulation or for, for, through, modeliz through model modelization, but I should say that, so the molecule, so this molecule is called anaconda, okay? So, and it's a molecule which has a very long uh, extracellular domain, which appears to be composed of three of a trimer, I mean a repetition of three molecules. So the basic idea is that this molecule will form an hexagonal. Uh, 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 how do you say this in English? Uh, what? A tri yes, yeah, a triangle, but with an hundred and twenty degree uh, actually uh, angle. So it will form. The molecule will be actually itself the extracellular part will be forming this triangle actually, and therefore when you connect. So, and the only position where it can actually stay is where you have three cells that meet. Actually. Okay? So, this is what, what is proposed. There is other molecule which has been shown to be localized at tricellular junction. Uh, how does it exactly work that the molecule can find this place? Something that we are not really working on because basically we did not discover this molecule anaconda. So, it will not be. Um, so, there is, there is someone called Stefan Mischlich. Uh, he mentioned that works on this problem, and I think he. He will actually find the mechanism by which you can target specifically a molecule at tricellular junction. There is several, as I mentioned, there is more and more molecules that appear to be localized at this position. Okay. Actually, I'm sure. Okay. Other question? Okay. So uh, now, if I take again this uh, this uh, general idea that, that I put at the beginning, so gene expression, change in the organization of the cytoskeleton, and generation of collective dynamic. See that, that an important aspect of uh, understanding morphogenesis or also the physics of tissues is to be able to describe the tissue and to be able to describe what you see under your microscope. Uh, I should say that biology is, is somehow a descriptive study, is a descriptive uh, science. We need to describe what we see if we would like to understand it. So uh, what we uh, wanted to do was to try to better describe what we see under the microscope. And I think it's not a movie. So as I mentioned, we have a large number of cells, 10,000 cells, which are going to divide, to rearrange, to undergo, as Jean-François mentioned, T1 transition or T2 transition. And so what we wanted to be able is to describe the dynamic of the overall tissues. Okay? And the issue that we encounter, it's a, it's a classical um, um, issue, is that if you look at the different dynamics that you can find in any tissue, you can find uh, at least four types of dynamics. <laughs> So the cell can change its shape. The cell can rearrange what uh, Jean-François called a T1. So at the beginning, uh, the cell, those two cells were neighbors, and then these become neighbors. The cell can undergo division, okay? and the cell can undergo estrogen or apoptosis. Okay? And ah, sorry, I, uh, this is, so this is the, the fourth process that we see in any tissues. Okay? So, of course, if you want to describe your tissue, one of the things that we decided to do was to skeletonize all the tissue and to track all the cells. Okay? So uh, I should say that I did it in a click, but it took two years, actually, because to segment the movie, to track all the cells. And so when you do, when you do so, basically, wh what you can get is basically uh, when the cell turns green, it means that you divide once. When it, when it divides a second time, it's darker and even darker. Okay? So this is the work of, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, of Boris Girao and uh, in close, very close collaboration with Francois Graner. So of course, when you have this, you can actually have the, the relative position of each individual cell, you, so you can see the flows of cell over time. And of course, you can count the event that you have under the microscope. So as I say, you have 25,000 cell division, you have 10 million cell contour that we tracked over time, uh, you have 200,000 cell arrangement, and we have roughly 3,000 apoptosis. The problem is that, those, and of course, you have to multiply those numbers by five because we need at least five movies to, to do something in biology. Okay? So those numbers are quite impressive. The problem is that somehow they, 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 does not, they do not allow you to study morphogenesis. And, and the reason why they don't allow you to study morphogenesis, because if you would like to study morphogenesis, you have to connect what happened at cell level and what happened at tissue scale level. So in other words, you have to somehow write that the growth and morphogenesis of the tissue will be equal to what happened through the contribution of cell division, through the contribution of size and shape changes, through the contribution of rearrangement, and through the process of apoptosis. 
Okay? So the biology, what the biologist would like to do would like to count basically the number of cell divisions, the number of rearrangement, and somehow sum them up so that he knows the morphogenesis of the tissues. Okay? So this is a, what the biologist would like to do. But uh, of course, as a physicist, when you look at those process, they look very much different. So the problem is how could you sum them up? They are like uh, tomatoes and bananas in an equation. I think this is the first thing that you check as a physicist, whether the equation is homogeneous, actually. Yes, so it's hard to, check, to, add, to add up a cell division and a cell rearrangement. In fact, it's very easy to add up a cell division and an apoptosis, equal one, actually. But adding up a cell rearrangement or a cell shape changes is very difficult. And, and this was actually the origin of our collaboration with Francois Graner. So this is exactly what we wanted to do. And so Francois Graner, uh, aside from developing this model for, uh, for understanding the dynamic of tissue, has been also working on foam. And in foam, he was facing actually the same uh, question. How could you describe the dynamic of a foam, knowing that you have actually uh, the change in the size of the bubble, the shape of the bubble. You have T1 transition and T2 transition. And uh, Francois Graner came up with, uh, and his group, came up actually with, uh, with uh, a relevant measurement that he calls a, te te a, te a texture tensor, where instead of thinking about the cell, which is here, we are going to think about the link between one cell and its neighbors. And I'm not going to go into the detail. From those links, you can actually generate a tensor okay, by doing the tensional products of each of these links. And you can have a quantity called a uh, ten uh, uh, texture tensor. And of course, when a cell is going to change its size, or when it's going to actually have T1 transition or cell division, what you are going to have is variation in the length or the orientation of those links and the number of those links. Okay? And using this, uh, this texture tensor, what Boris Girao did in the lab is to generalize it to tissue to introduce cell division. And I have to say that this was a, quite a complex process, actually, a complex uh, study. And so now what we can do is that we can replace each of those processes by a simple unit, which is a circle and a bar, which represent actually the component of this tensor. So the circle will re represent the uh, weather. So when you have a circle which is, uh, which, is, which is like this, no gray, it means that you have a dilation, an isotropic dilation. So this is a trace of your tensor. And the bar will tell you that the tissue has elongated in one direction locally and contract in the opposite direction. So this is the devi deviatoric part of the tensor. Okay? So it's a, it's a simple representation for biologists that will tell you that, for example, during this size and shell shape changes, what has, what has happened is basically that the cell has slightly grown and has elongated in one direction. But the key is that you can represent all the other processes exactly with the same unit. Okay? So for example, here, during this apoptosis, the tissue has locally shrink, but it has slightly shrink more in one direction. Okay? So therefore, now you can actually compute each of those cell dynamics in the same unit. And therefore, you can represent or decompose the overall morphogenesis of your tissues in each of the cell dynamic events. So, and here I'm showing you only the bar. So this is a measurement of morphogenesis. So this means that the tissue has been elongated in one direction here. But what is important is that you can decompose this tissue into this, this dynamic into the role of cell division, the role of sorry, the role of cell, of cell the contribution of cell shape changes, cell rearrangement, and apoptosis. And therefore, what happens is that in each of the regions of the tissue, you can actually write what I call an equation, where you are going to relate the morphogenesis and the growth of a tissue to the contribution of each individual processes. Okay? And what is key, actually, for us as a biologist is that you see what appears in this equation is only the biological process that we know of. Okay? Of course, you can add other processes. So, for example, you can add flux, you can add appearance of cell, or you can add even fusion of cell. And what is very interesting is that what we did in, in this in this uh, publication, for example, is that we remove completely cell division, looking at a mutant, and we an therefore analyze what was the contribution of cell division to tissue morphogenesis. Another aspect that is very interesting in this formalism that, that, that Boris developed in the lab, uh, in fact, we developed it in 2D, and in fact, we use it or we implement it in 2D, but the formalism is already valid in 3D. In fact, if you give me a movie which has been segmented, and for which you have the dynamic, which is the most complex part, you can actually directly use it on 3D tissues. 
Okay? So except that this measurement will not be a two by two matrices, but a three by three. I agree, we have been starting to apply it with a collaborator, so Valentina Greco, we applied it to understand the process of tissue repair in mouse. And more recently, we applied part of it um, with uh, the group of Daniel Avignevich to understand actually the dynamic of crypt in the intestine. So therefore, what is quite nice here is that you have a formalism. So I should say that it's only purely descriptive that allows you to characterize the full dynamic of your tissue and how you relate in cell dynamics with tissue scale dynamic. And therefore, you can use it to study any mutant or any experimental condition. Okay? No question? Okay. So, the last part I would like to discuss is uh, um, mechanical feedback. So, as from the beginning of my talk, I presented this in a very linear fashion where you have the genetics that regulate the, 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 the organization of motors that will generate forces and will generate, actually, deformation of the tissues. Uh, I think most of you know that, that uh, mechanical forces can feed back on gene expression. Okay? And there is a lot of experiments in vitro also uh, where basically people have been exerting mechanical forces on cells and looking at what is the impact of those mechanical forces on, for example, proliferation. And we know that if you pull on a, on a layer of cell, this will lead to proliferation of those cells. What we wanted to study was uh, what is the response of a tissue to an endogenous morphogenetic forces. So, of course, our tissue is actually changing shape. So, and we wanted to understand when those forces are going to be ex exerted in our tissues, how the tissue reacts to those forces. And this is where I'm going to discuss, actually, how cells can sense their size. Uh, so, of course, if we would like to understand how, force, uh, how cell responds to external forces, we first need to measure forces. And so, um, so there is many methods uh, to, to actually estimate forces within the tissue. I will show you several. Uh, Jean-Francois showed you one where you ablate the junction so you can infer tension. And here, what we wanted to use was a method that has been actually developed by Kaoru uh, Sujimura and Suji Ishihara in Japan with whom we have been collaborating. And the method that they develop is so-called force inference, where the idea is that you are going to take a segmented image of your tissues. You are going to write force balance at each vertex. And uh, solving the, the associated uh, system of equation, you can actually estimate the tension in each junction. And if you can estimate the tension in each junction, you can have an estimation of the stress within the tissues that we are going to represent, again, by those bars, which will tell you the direction of stress and isotropy. So it means when you have a bar like this, it means that the tissue is under a stress in this direction. Okay? And uh, the key is that this method is non-invasive. It's an inference. And therefore, what you can do is to apply it to each image of the tissues. So you can have an idea of how the junction, what we call the junctional stress evolves during development. Okay? And if you concentrate on this region, I think you, can, you could have seen that, for example, the anisotropy of the stress increase. Okay, this is the red curve here. The, the, tissue, the stress becomes more and more anisotropic. At the same time, the tissue elongates in this direction. So, of course, the first thing that we wanted to do was to validate uh, what this force inference method gives. So, what we did was to do laser ablation. So, what we are going to do here is that we are going to cut the tissues. And you see that you have a recoil. And we can measure the recoil when you cut in this direction, which will give you an estimation of the stress of the stress in this direction. So this is a blue curve here. So you see that as a time uh, developmental time increase, you have more and more uh, recoil velocity in this direction, and also you have more recoil velocity in this direction. So the stress increase and the anisotropy of the stress also increase. And therefore, we can actually have two time points: 18-hour APF where we have low stress and 26-hour APF, where we have high stress. To see the time. Okay, so I think I'm not going to give you the end of the story. But, uh, and uh, so, uh, so what, what uh, Rezus did, because here, what is very nice is that you have a short time scale, 18 to 26-hour APF, so eight hours, where we can actually really film the dynamic of the tissue as the stress increases. So, okay? so what Rezus did, was to record the dynamic of the tissue, again using e which, are going to, which is going to label the cell junction, and myosin, 
which is going to label the cortex. And uh, I hope we can show you this again. So here you are in a situation where you have low stress. Okay, the cell tend to divide. And I hope that you can see, I hope the movie will stop, okay. that the cell, uh, okay, I'm going to show you this here. So here you see, this is the, the tissue at 18 hour APF where you don't have much stress. So the, 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 tissue, the myosin organization is what is classical scene. So where you have mostly, most of the myosin being cortical, okay? But as stress increases, you see that you can start to form those fibers of myosin, okay? In the middle of the cell. You can see them, okay? And what was uh, quite nice is that as the stress increased, we see that we form more and more myosin fibers. Okay? And those myosin fibers are oriented along the direction of the stress. So you have stress that increases, and you form those fibers. Okay? So I think those fibers, might, you might recall what they are. They are classic, classical stress fibers, which has been observed in individual cells. So when you have a cell which is in culture, they tend to form fiber, actomyosin structure, which are uh, actually anchored at the ECM, okay, and form and are aligned with uh, the cell. Here you can see them. Okay? So they have been extensively studied in individual cells, and they are quite important in migration, cell shape, and mechanosensing. Here, what I would like to show you is that those fibers are quite particular because they are not anchored to the ECM, they are anchored at the adherent junction. Here you have a cell, this is a calorie in purple, and you see that the fiber is actually at the level of the apex of the cell. Okay, you can see one of those fibers. Okay? So the first thing that we wanted, so it seems that, so, and we will call those uh, fibers apical stress fibers, I will tell you why. But the, one of the things that we can do, for example, is to show that they are under stress. Okay? As you would expect for stress fibers. We could also show that actually many components which are known to be localized at stress fibers okay, are localized where they should be in those stress fibers. Resus slightly overkill it, but we, we could actually see. And um, the, so therefore, those fibers, even though they are localized at the apex of the cell and they are anchored at the adherent junction, they seem to look like stress fibers. Okay? And this, was, this is something quite interesting because those fibers have been extensively studied in individual cells but the, the, the function in tissue is really not so, so well understood. And so, as I mentioned, they form as the mechanical stress increase. And so this gives us the idea that indeed they are a response to the mechanical stress. So to analyze this, what we did, what Rezus did, was to uh, prevent myosin contractility on the lateral side of the tissues, okay? So by expressing, uh, by removing uh, myosin activity, and what you can see is that this is a wild type context where you see nicely those fibers okay, that form. But if you remove myosin contractility on the lateral side, first you decrease the stress within the central region and also you lose the formation of those fibers. So from this, we concluded that this, this fiber form in response to mechanical stress. Okay. So of course, this led us to try to envision what could be their function. And um, so for this, we, 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 we actually identified a mutant which is important for the formation of those fibers. So the way we do, we do so, we generate a group of cells which is mutant here for alpha actinin. So this is the blue cell here. And we are, what we are going to see on this movie is that while the wild type cell here, the normal cells are actually forming those fibers, if you look at the, blue, the cells which are flashing in blue from time to time, you can see that they don't have any fibers, while the neighboring cells do have fibers. And this is actually shown here, the quantification, the number of fibers. Um, so maybe I will, I will, because it's almost time to finish. I think. Yeah, I have two minutes, so. I will so um, what is important is that if you remove the activity of those fibers first, the cell do elongate. Okay, so they seems to those fibers seems to prevent the elongation of the cell. And also, if you look at how the tissues uh, elongate, you can see that when you don't have fiber in this alpha actinin mutant, the tissue elongate more. Okay? So the, those fibers which form at the apex of the cell appear to prevent cell elongation and therefore to prevent tissue elongation. So uh, Jean-François mentioned that there is a lot of vertex model which has been developed and those vertex models were developed in order to study the role of cortical tension and adhesion. But there was no vertex model that has been developed in the context of the presence of stress fibers. So this is actually at this point that we team up with uh, David Lubinsky 
that decided to develop uh, with his student, Merrill Spencer, a very simple vertex model, which is a, a regular hexagonal vertex model, where he add up, just adds stress fibers. Okay? And based, so the idea behind a very simple vertex model was that it was analytically tractable. Okay? And um, what, he, the, what the model uh, lead is that indeed, uh, apical stress fiber limits cell elongation. And in fact, uh, stress fibers are more efficient at limiting cell elongation than upregulating the tension on this junction. Okay? And so this is shown here. For example, here, you are, if you have a cell, for the same amount of uh, uniaxial stress, for example, a cell without stress fiber will elongate, while the same cell but with stress fibers will not elongate. Okay? In, in the, the basic idea is that by had, adding stress fiber, you're adding... Uh, tensile component, you are increasing the density of tensile component, okay? and therefore you prevent the elongation of your cell. So, okay, so this is the two uh, finding of the model. Actually, we can, uh, this is exactly what we found. For example, if we ablate a stress fiber, you will see that indeed the stress fiber seems to prevent cell elongation. This is also quantified in the mutant. And here, for example, we are in an alpha actinine mutant, so we don't have stress fibers. So you see that basically, the junction on the tension is going to be much higher in the alpha actin mutant, but the elongation is higher. So even so, you have actually put more tension on the adherent junction along the direction of stress, your cell is actually more elongated. This was the two aspects, the two predictions of the model. But the model made an additional prediction, and I will, I will stop here actually. The model made this, this additional prediction that, that I think is, 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 is really a prediction because it's something that we hadn't at all thought of looking at uh, in the experimental context. The model made the following prediction. The model said that, in fact, the number of uh, apical stress fibers uh, per cell will scale with cell area. And larger cells will need more stress fiber to resist mechanical stress and to prevent elongation. In other words, if you want to maintain your shape, a bigger cell will need more stress fiber than a small cell. Okay? And this was the prediction that came out of this analytical model. Okay? And uh, so I should say that, that this is the prediction that they made. So for a given amount of stress, if you want your cell to stay hexagonal, if you have a big cell, you need more stress fiber than a small cell. Okay? So, and therefore, uh, this was a very uh, interesting uh, uh, prediction for us because it connects somehow uh, the response of the tissues, but introduces another an additional parameter that has not been really studied, is how cell responds according to their area. Okay? So there is a lot of study that has been actually analyzing how cell and tissue responds to mechanical stresses. But in general, the aspect of how this depends on the cell size has not been studied. And as Jean-François mentioned, when a cell divide, when cell divide within the tissue, you have a large heterogeneity of cell size, actually. So it becomes a very interesting question to understand how basically different cells of, with different size might respond to the same, actually, stress. So, of course, this was like a lot of speculation, and I'm going to show you one uh, result, and then I will end, that indeed the, the, the prediction of the model was correct, because if you actually look at the size of the cell, so this is increasing cell size, if you look at the mean number of uh, stress fiber per cell, there is a nice increase, and a linear increase as predicted, as predicted by the model. So, there's two questions two question that came up. Basically, how is this important to prevent the elongation of the big cell? Okay? And, in fact, I'm not showing, going to show you this because this is, this is the end, basically. So, it is indeed the case. Larger cells need more stress fiber to prevent the elongation. And, of course, the question was how now the cell can sense his apical area. And, in fact, this is again connected to the position of the tricellular junction. Not actually, it's connected to the number of tricellular junctions and to the relative distribution. Okay. So, if I just end by uh, showing you the idea, the general idea. I'm sorry, I was a little too long. So what I have tried to show you in the first part of the talk is that when a cell divides, I just rotate the diagram by 90 degrees. So uh, when a cell divides, it will divide according to its cell shape and so that you actually reduce actually the anisotropy of the cell. 
But what we have seen in this other part is that, in fact, stress fibers are going to form, and the number of stress fibers is going to scale with the cell area, and this scaling is going to be important so that larger cells do not elongate within the tissues. And more importantly, we could connect also the, the number of stress fibers with the signaling activity within the cell. And therefore, what we have been able to find is that the amount of signaling pathways within the cell, which is turned on, really directly scale with the size of the cell, and this is also regulated by stress fibers. So therefore, what we would like to propose is that those tricellar junctions act as Q, encoding both shape and size information. And with this, I would like to end, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>